We belong to a predominantly Christian country, and perhaps we grew up learning from our parents how to pray. Did we ever wonder about the challenges the apostles faced during their time? The Christians were a minority, and many believed in false gods. Perhaps we encounter more people nowadays who doubt the existence of God. Before we proceed to part 4 of Theology of Prayer, let us pause and ponder what may help us reach out to friends who do not believe in God, belong to other faiths, or think that all religions are the same. Through this lecture, Father John Paul will suggest ways by which we can approach non-believers through their reason, for philosophy provides an excellent method to explore evidence for the existence of God. Keep in mind, however, that openness and accompaniment are fundamental if we are to encourage friends to start praying. The Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Paul, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint John, pray for us. That all of us would want to relate to a higher being. It's a present in in many of the humanities cultures throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia. In art, in the, in the way they talk to each other, civilizations have pointed towards man trying to think of what happens after the afterlife. There he finds, he also asks, he begins to search the meaning of his existence. He always relates it to a higher being. Now, since the primitive man, in other words, we have always feared the dimension called a religious dimension. Perhaps in modernity, now that the world is more complex, more complicated, and we are more isolated, we are with their screens, um, and perhaps with some tragic uh, experiences of some people, there has been the question of whether God exists, and it's the question of atheism. However, this is a recent question. At the end, no, since the, the, the beginning, or the dawn of humanity, the religious dimension has always been a given. Okay? And we have, we have um, this religious dimension, and man, through time, and also with Catholicism, we have tried to think how we defend the, the truth of our faith that God exists, the truth of the religious dimension through many ways. And this is one of the main points of this class. We will try to study here some what we call proofs from the world, cosmological proofs, and some proofs also trying to read man. I think all of us known persons, we have friends, we have relatives, have began questioning and also have been affirming uh, that God does not exist. So this is um, uh, one of the important uh, topics or takeaways, rather, that hopefully you will be clear about at the end of this. Why could they say that? And what are these words called the agnostic system? And what is that religious indifferentism? What is pluralism as a bonus? You will also learn that here. Okay, first, this religious dimension. I already mentioned earlier the various expressions of religiosity in the paintings of the primitive man, in the cultures, no? um, reference. There's also a reference towards the divine. You think of the Greeks, there's a mythology copied by the Romans. You think of uh, the caveman, there is um, some relation to divinity. They try to think of the sun as the god. They try to look at the rain, the thunder, natural phenomenon as being sent by God. And all these um, greatness in humanity is taken up by our faith. So our faith, Christian Christianity, takes up all that is good in that search for God. What we have learned 
um, ever since in man and that worship of God through his religion, in his religious history. So we take that in, those, in, in, our, in our faith as well, the religiosity by nature. And we defend this using some proofs. They are proofs not in the sense that they are empirical in proof information because God is never object of empirical investigation. Now, they are proofs because somehow they lead us to philosophically sound or clearly well argued uh, points that are very convincing. Okay? So uh, the man who, who, who was able to um, arrange all this knowledge is the 13th century saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas. Now, saint Thomas Aquinas wrote or, or theorized what he calls the five ways. Uh, these are the five ways uh, in, in general that proves God's existence. They are what you call cosmological proofs because they are based on observing the cosmos, the world, and you arrive at the existence of a higher being. First mover. We observe in this world that there are so many causes and effects. Now, every cause can be imagined to have a chain of them, and it cannot be that it grows back infinitely. There always will be a prime mover, a first mover. It's so difficult to imagine that it's a cyclical thing regarding causes and effects. Okay, so that points towards God's existence. He is not only the first mover, he is also the first cause. The efficient cause and effect. I will not elaborate you know, these five ways. Third way of St. Thomas is about necessity. If you and I are what you call beings that could be here or not, because I could have been born, and I, I also, it's possible that I could not have been born you know, if my parents did not meet, etc. It's impossible that all of us are contingent because something costs this being's existence, and there's one necessary being, therefore, and that necessary being is God. Third way. The fourth way of St. Thomas. If there, in this world, we find degrees of perfection, some are beautiful, some are more beautiful than those things, and there's a degree, a gradation of it, and we can definitely imagine that there's beauty by which they all participate or share from, or share with. And that premium beauty, premium truth, premium unity, premium goodness is God. So this is a support way of Aquinas. And then last but not the least, intelligence, the way of intelligence, since in this world, there is such an order, there are laws of gravity, there are laws of time and space, it's so difficult to imagine that this is, that all this is random. There must be a premium intelligence, a prime mover, a prime thinker who have thought all of these things. And the final cause of that is that we call God. So you see that all these five ways are very, very rational. I mean, an ordinary guy in the States, after this class, we get well, almost all in the Philippines accept the existence of God anyway. But um, a, a person who begins questioning him because of the tragic events can already be given this uh, five ways, and it is enough. No? It's, it's a very logical reasoning that I believe in this God, uh, this existence at least. We did, uh, we did not mention that when uh, we did not mention this, but uh, beneath the reasoning of those five ways is that there is a is there this prerequisite, meaning this requirement that our knowledge is not something we invent. It's something that is of the world. It is based on reality. It's based on realism. We have to observe things, and it leads us to knowledge. 
the knowledge that we possess, yung mga alam natin, is not something that we just thought of. We just discovered. We observe reality. When you do that, the cosmological proofs acquires its significance and importance. No? We will be able to understand it. A person who is open to the truth no, um, can discuss and converse with you and easily arrive at it. The thought can rise from the visible, the observable, to the invisible causes. Okay, so that is what you call those cosmological proofs. But not only are they the unique ways by which we arrive at God, uh, His existence, there is what you call the anthropological proofs. Anthropos means man. So you look at man, you look at yourself, you look at your uh, dreams, ambitions, you look at your capacities, kaya mo na to discover that God exists. Okay, let's, let's itemize those. First point, because you are open to infinity. You are open to spiritual realities. You are open to the truth and beauty. And so look at yourself. Now that openness, my openness, must have come from somewhere. And it can lead you prima, to the capital T truth. As you know, uh, all these things, get to know uh, discoveries, knowledge, in the empirical and in the spiritual, you're open to that. Okay, where does this openness come from? It comes from another person, definitely. It comes from God. And then you look at man, then, and he and you realize that he always has a sense of goodness or moral goodness. There is in man a sense of right and wrong. Regardless, regardless of you directing him. So there is something in man called a law in his heart. And the existence of that law points toward another being outside of him. It leads us to God. Number two. In the anthropological uh, play, he realizes that there is also the concept called freedom. We will discuss this much later in Moras, but it's so easy to understand that there, in his heart, he feels responsible for his actions. He's responsible for or to someone. Later on, this someone, he will realize it's another person who loves him, and that is God. There is a voice in him called conscience, always remind him what's good and what's right. Okay, that longing for infinity, fourth point. He always wants to be happy. He wants to be here forever. This longing for infinity speaks of the infinite being as well. So we will know this later on in scriptures. Is made in image and likeness of another, another being with a capital B. All those desires in the spiritual plane of infinity, we want to be here forever, we want to be eternal, we want to be happy. These are so spiritual considerations, ambitions, points us towards God's existence. Okay, now, evil. There is what you call the absence of good. If there is an innocent uh, child who is suffering there, how can you tell me, Father, that there is a God? And that's the main question of so many people, and the existence of evil, in fact, turns them off. In a nutshell, this evil is also a way to God. Why are you crying? Why are you complaining about those things? It's because you have a longing for happiness. I turn it around, this argument. You are longing for something great. You're longing for goodness. You're aspiring for perfection. And that in itself points towards, as we earlier mentioned, to a being that is beyond you. If you turn it around and you realize that each person, by a complaint of evil itself, is actually longing for happiness, for greatness, is a clamor for justice. Spiritual reality is the place in his heart, not, by, on, not, not on his own, but by another person. How is it possible that people 
despite all those things that you mentioned, Father, they sound logical, and I do believe in God, how is it possible that my friends are atheists? Now, this is a very complicated uh, question. There's also a, a complicated um, answer for every individual. But we will speak here about generalities. If you gave me, Father, cosmological proofs, anthropological proofs that are so convincing, how come faith is not um, received by other person? And they don't also profess it. Well, we can only cite a few things here. First, because what I mentioned are not full proofs. Uh, they can you faith is reasonable, but God is not the object of investigation. God is not existence, not like 1 plus 1 equals 2. So it's not the same level of evidence. When we say that God exists, we are, we are not saying who He is yet. A reasoning can detect that He does exist, but it cannot arrive at that who this personal being is. The fact that you and I are dealing with Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, this is not based on a reason anymore. It's something we receive called faith, revelation. Okay? So it's not easy to believe in this uh, in existence of God because it's not easy for me, by my reason alone, to relate to this person. Next, because uh, all those things, but I actually said this earlier, are not easily deduced philosophically. Despite that, the fact they are proofs, a person is always free to believe or not. There is a freedom in every, every time he ascends to the faith. The person himself is the cause of that faith in his response. But it has to be given to him. We know that this faith, now I speak now in the supernatural plane, is really, in the end, a gift. The person, a friend, a relative, who is not a believer, we have to really use the supernatural means. And then, last but not least, and this is also important, because many non-believers, no, like you and me, are immersed in what you call offenses against God, sin, and would want to justify that position. I want to be continuing my lifestyle. And that's why I don't want to believe in your God. I don't want to believe in God because that God will dictate me what to do. Definitely. Because thinking about God and this question of God makes me guilty. Okay, I don't know even what narcissism is. Human reason cannot conclude anything about God. It's a humanism without God. Anyway, there's also a concept called religious indifferentism. I'm indifferent, whichever religion you think to me. They're all equal to me. And what do you say about that? About those two things? Well, I mentioned earlier to you that the religious independentism is difficult, difficult to sustain Atheism and agnosticism are both difficult to sustain. You need several distractions to stop yourself from asking the deep questions in life. It takes an effort to keep these questions, meaning of life and death, meaning of all our actions, away. You have to numb your conscience because they're always are pivotal events. But still, with the hardness of my heart, that is also possible. When a person falls in love, it's easier for him to believe. When a person becomes a dad or a mom, this miracle of life, it's easier to go believe in God. Those underneath the sea uh, and see all the beauty of all those things. Now, when you see beauty, see the beauty of nature, there must be a God. It's so easy to explain. But the problem of religious indifferentism is different. Uh, but there's a new one there. Okay, I am indifferent, indifferent to the question of religion. The other one, the pluralism, which is this thing called all the other religions are the same for me. Okay, the Catholic faith teaches that all other religions has its value, 
there's what you call a spark, even in Islam and in other faiths, in Judaism, obviously because we inherit so many things from them, Christians, there's a, a, a spark there in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, but they are incomplete. And the, 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 the revelation of Jesus Christ for us is the complete one, fullness of revelation. World religions are important. This is the Catholic faith. This is how we see it. Nostra Etate, a document by the Church. Nostra Etate is Latin for in our time. The declaration was approved in 1965 in the Second Vatican Council, where bishops were meeting to make a host of changes to Catholic teachings and practice. The document said the Church can recognize truth in other religions and urges dialogue with followers of other faiths. There is value in all these world religions. It speaks of the transcendent dignity of man. They must be all respected, but we cannot say that these religions are equal to us person who goes, I would say, you know, from Christianity, all these things, you know, has not really known his own faith. Judaism, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, well, Scientism, Islam, Christianity, the key and the role. Our attitude our, our regarding those other faiths is that of appreciating them. We know that there are seeds of truth, there are goodness sparks of the truth in them and they hopefully arrive in what we believe as Christianity. We have to study what are those excesses in their religions because there's definitely superstition there, hard to reconcile with reason. For example, the Hindus, Hinduism, they believe in what you call reincarnation. Very difficult to argue. But you, after your life here, if you behave badly, you can be a cockroach, a rodent, etc., etc. And if you've been, you know, you've been okay, you'll be a holy cow. <laughs> no, that's true. And that's why the cows are holy for them. We also have to dialogue with them in the religious dialogue because we can learn from them. I in Rome, I I, I live there because I studied there. The Jose priest, we study there. We get we become priests there. I remember being so moved by Muslims in that holy city, eternal city, because in the MRTs or in the trains, they are very punctual with their prayer. They use the map and they start adoring Mecca, adoring God facing the east, facing Mecca rather. So we can also learn from that piety of our Muslim brothers, for example.